Welcome to The Faithful Steward. This is a podcast all about sharing biblical wisdom and practical insights in order to help church leaders pursue and teach financial freedom as part of Christian discipleship. We believe this is a spiritual conversation and this is a place where the church needs to lead the way in order to move our communities forward in how we steward God's resources. I'm your host, James Lenhoff, and I am so passionate about this conversation and helping leaders have the confidence to step into it. We believe that if we help people thrive financially and grow spiritually, it changes everything. And I am so excited to join you on this journey. This podcast is brought to you by GoodSense. If you'd like more information about what we're up to, you can go to our website at goodsensemovement.org. All right, let's get started with today's conversation. So today I want to talk about what happens with increase. You know, as you think back over your career, I would imagine you, like many of us, can point to times where you made less money than you're making now. For the vast majority of us, as we progress through our career and we grow in our confidence and our abilities, we grow in our status inside the team that we're working on, we do tend to make more money. And yet for a lot of us, we look at that and say, where to go? What happened to it? I should be feeling better. I should have more margin. I should be more confident in my finances because I'm making more than I've ever made. And yet I still don't feel like I've arrived. I still don't feel like there's enough. And so often when we look at that, it's because we're still paying for things that we bought in the past in order to increase and elevate our lifestyle, in order to medicate emotions that we were feeling. And that tends to translate into credit card debt. And we've talked a lot about that in the debt conversation that we had earlier in the podcast. But what I want to make sure we recognize is that in situations where we are using future dollars, we're using tomorrow's pay raises in order to buy today's wants, in order for us to satisfy some sense of inadequacy or failure or to feel more significant and more uh, comfortable in our own skin, we're using tomorrow's extra resources that we don't have today. And then when they come around, when we do get that raise, when we do see that promotion come through, we've already spent it. And what we spent it on is already worthless. And so that's why credit card debt can be so destructive is as we're progressing, we feel like we're spinning our wheels because we're still paying interest on things we've long since consumed. But there's another reason why we find ourselves spinning our wheels as that increase comes through, and that is that we see ourselves allowing lifestyle creep to take over. We find that as we make more money, we justify in our mind the bigger house, the nicer car, and we tell ourselves we deserve it, we need it, that somehow we have now arrived at a place where our lifestyle should continue to creep up and follow our income because that will make us feel satisfaction. That will make us feel happy. That will get us to a place of contentment if we just continue to chase whatever that next step forward is in our lifestyle. And so when you couple this uh, paying for past purchases, this continuing to, to chew on credit card debt, and this sense of entitlement and that I deserve to step up and to continue to grow my lifestyle, we end up eating up all of those increases and we never can fully understand where they went. Now, if you are not tracking your expenses, if you don't know what your life currently costs, this is really dangerous because we tend to experience life in the marginal change. What I mean by that is that we only really feel what's different about our lives. And so we get used to the car that we're driving. We get used to the house that we're living in. We're just comfortable in it. It's normal but we don't feel that sense of excitement and energy around it because it's just our phone. It's the same phone we've had for a while. There's nothing about that that's giving us energy. It's just our car that we've been driving from A to B for a while. It doesn't have that new car smell. It doesn't feel like it did the day we bought it. Or it's just that house that has all those issues (laughs) that we have to deal with and we have to find some time 
to repair. And those issues and the, that familiarity and that sense of uh, normalcy is actually uncomfortable. We want new, we want exciting, we want different. And the only way we get that is by creating change, by getting a new thing for our house or a new house, by getting a new car or a different uh, phone in order for us to feel some sense, some jolt of excitement and energy about this new thing. And so if we haven't tracked what our life is currently costing us, then we just assume because we have more income, we have more money to spend on the next new thing, and we can medicate that sense of boredom or that sense of inadequacy by spending. This is what we call the lure of more. The lure of more is incredibly toxic because it's constantly wooing us to whatever that next experience would be of something that's different, something that's new. And that lure of more is what ultimately leads to lifestyle creep. The way that I describe the lure of more is this longshore drift. When we think about going to the beach and you plant your umbrella in the sand, and you put your cooler down and you splash around in the waves with your kids. And then at some point you pop up and you look back at the beach and you say, where's our stuff? And what you find is that you have been drifting sideways. You never intended to swim down the shore. It just happened. And your stuff is 150 yards away from you because you just allowed that drift to take you. That lure of more is really powerful, particularly in our society. I actually would argue that the U.S. economy depends on us succumbing to the lure of more. The U.S. economy depends on us constantly feeling this sense of discontent and wanting the next thing and the next new experience because that's how they sell us the next phone. That's how they sell us the next car is by giving us a sense of inadequacy or making us feel uh, uncomfortable in that boredom of the things we're already used to. And so that lure of more just quietly pulls us along. And what happens a lot of times is couples will pop up out of that current and recognize that they never intended to be here, that they never had any intentionality of deciding ahead of time what they're going to spend that increase on, what they're going to protect in terms of margin, how we're going to set aside resources for generosity. They just got pulled along in the, hey, we have some extra money. Let's spend it on the next new thing. Let's give ourselves that, ourselves that jolt of excitement and energy because we'll feel something different. But we pay for that lure of more, that marginal change with a marginal cost. What I mean by that is, we don't experience the fullness of the sacrifices we're already making in order to live the life we live. We don't fully grasp what this career is costing us in terms of time away from our families. We don't fully grasp what that house is costing us in terms of just the upkeep and the decorations and the stuff that we're spending. We don't realize what that next new car lease or financing is costing us in missed opportunities to invest in family, to invest in things we care about, to invest in generosity for causes or for families in need. We miss what it's actually costing us because we're used to it. Just like we get used to the experience of those things, we get used to the sacrifices we're making to pay for those things. That's why the lure of more is so toxic. When we think about that marginal cost, we can make decisions like, well, you know, this, this next new house only costs this much in additional mortgage payment, or that next car is only this much in a, in a monthly payment on the loan or the lease. We're only thinking in the change of what that next step forward costs. And as a result, we continue to make further and further sacrifices on the things we actually care about and the things that would actually bring us fulfillment. It's so frustrating that this is our human condition. This is how the world works, but this is not what was intended for us. This is not what it looks like to live in a sense of peace and contentment and what the Bible calls shalom. This sense of completeness, steadiness, 
our God is a God of shalom. Our God is a God that wants us to sit in a sense of steady, complete contentment. And yet the world is constantly fighting against us sitting in that space because they can't monetize shalom. They can't make money off of a sense of contentment and peace. They need to keep us discontent. They need to keep us uncomfortable, feeling inadequate, so that we medicate that discomfort by spending. And so the tool that we need to put in place when we come across increase is the lifestyle cap. I want to be very clear. Increase is a good thing. We want to experience increase. We want to grow in our career. We want to grow in our incomes. We want our increase to continue to fuel abundance in our life. But we need to be intentional about when that increase comes, what choices we will have made ahead of time, rather than just reacting to it emotionally in the moment. We will see our lifestyle grow. You know, I think about when Amy and I were first married, uh, we lived in a one bedroom apartment. We had no kids. We were eating ramen noodles. We were just getting by and it was fine. It was adequate. It was contentment to some degree. I think about, could I be content in that space now? Unfortunately, probably not because we have three kids and they take up way more space than a one bedroom apartment can handle. And so we have seen our lifestyle grow. And I would love to say that all of those growth decisions were intentional and well thought out. Some of them were absolutely just being subject to the lure of more, no question. But what I want us to try to do and what I want us to teach our communities to do is to pay attention, to be aware of the fact that if increase comes, we need to have a plan in place now so that when it comes, we don't waste it. When it comes, we don't turn into a selfish indulgence and just spend it on ourselves. We actually have set the boundaries in place for us to experience shalom and not need that extra to spend it on ourselves in order to feel some sense of peace and adequacy. So this is a multifaceted process for us to prepare for increase. And one of the first and probably most important steps is for us to define our non-negotiables as a family. What are the things that matter the most to us? What have we decided we are about as a family? Whether this to you sounds like a family vision or a set of family values, whatever those things are that give you handles as a family to decide, this is what we will always say yes to. These are the things we are always going to pick up and take hold of. But by definition, that means that we will put down other things that might get in the way. We need to wrestle to the ground those non-negotiables as a family to decide this is our yes and that means these things are always a no. We will say no to things that will block our yes. We will say no to things that will keep us from confidently picking up the stuff that matters. And so if the things that matter most to you as a family are things like having dinners together, well, then you'll have to be constantly saying no to things that would pull you away from that family time. Things like traveling jobs that would require you being gone all the time. You may make more money, yes, but you would have to be sacrificing something you've decided is too important. Maybe one of the things that's most important to you is travel as a family. You want to experience all of the amazing things about this beautiful planet. You want to go see God's creation. You want to go and discover other cultures. Well, if that's a priority then that may mean you have to live in a smaller house. You have to drive a maybe a, a less uh, exciting car. You, you need to put yourself in a position where you have organized your finances around being able to afford those adventures together as a family. These are not both and. They are mutually exclusive. You can't have this and this. You have to choose. And the reason why that's such a powerful process is because it crystallizes what matters most, and gives you the confidence as a family to say the consequences of this yes are worth it. The consequences of the yes to travel and adventure together are worth a smaller house. We are deciding together as a family that we want 
to sacrifice these things in order to gain access to these things. The reason why that's so important for increase is if we haven't done that ahead of time, then we will end up spending that increase on things we'll find out later are actually stealing from us what's most important. And a lot of times we don't find that out until the kids are up and on their own. We don't find that out until we are well into empty nesters and we look back and we say, oh my gosh, I wish we had been more intentional. I wish we had spent more on the things that we now know matter the most because our heart is aching because we, we missed it. We overemphasize things that it turns out we didn't actually care about. And so we need to decide ahead of time, what do we care about? So that when that increase comes, we're funneling that increase into those things that are most important. Secondly, we need to establish then our lifestyle cap. And the lifestyle cap is what takes the teeth out of that lure of more. It allows us to say this far, no further. We will be content. We will experience shalom in this context, in this much spending on these things, in this kind of house, in this kind of car, we are deciding ahead of time, this is enough. And so when the lure of more comes along, when the marketing messages say, hey, you know, you'd be a lot happier if you were living in a bigger house or driving a nicer car, you know, you could actually experience a whole lot more contentment and joy if you just had this tech gadget or that experience. We can say to that lure, no, I've already decided ahead of time that these are the things that bring me contentment. This is what I need in order to feel confident and steady and this full sense of completeness and shalom. And so I don't need to spend the increase on those things. I don't need to let my lifestyle chase my income in order to feel that sense of peace. I can feel that right now. And the beauty of the lifestyle cap is it will by default allow margin to grow, allow there to be excess and extra that we don't immediately spend so that we can work that muscle of the having of resources, right? I talked about in one of the podcasts recently that one of the hardest things about money is the having of it. It's just letting it sit there, waiting for a purpose for it, not constantly telling ourselves what we could do with it and then spending that money recklessly because we're too uncomfortable just letting the money be there. The lifestyle cap is what empowers us to do just that. We've decided ahead of time what we're going to spend, how we're going to spend it. And so when extra comes, we can let it be there and wait for God to give us direction for what to do with his resources. So over time, we will see that that lifestyle cap changes. Right, The lifestyle cap that Amy and I had when we had two kids is very different than the lifestyle cap we had when we had our third child. There's just more costs involved. And so we will flex and adjust to what we are wanting to experience as a family. We sit down every year and we have a conversation together as a family about what we want to do, what is most important, what meets and, and, and hits our target as values for our family. How are we going to live that out this in this next 12 months? And what's that going to take? And once we've established that this is what we need in order for all of that to happen, then if more than that comes in, we set it aside for future obedience, we set it aside for abundance, and we wait for God to tell us what to do with that extra that he gave to us for a reason. And that reason was not for us to indulge and spend it on ourselves. That reason is for us to be prepared for obedience when he asks us to act. That is what a lifestyle cap can unlock for us, is the beauty of immediate obedience, of acting in the moment when God says, do this with those resources that I gave you that you already know you don't need. What a beautiful gift to be ready to act. And the reason why a lot of times families have been taken out of the kingdom work that's in front of them is because they don't have that confidence. They've been spending that extra. They've been running their lifestyle right to the edge. And so even if God says, hey, I want you to lift the burden of that family, or I really want you to engage in generously connecting with this cause that I know you care about, that person is stuck in a sense of fear and, and 
uh, uncertainty. How? How do I afford to do that? Where does that money come from? It makes it worse. It makes it harder to obey. And if we can just reverse that script, if we can just get to a place where we draw that line, then the opposite feedback loop starts to happen. That extra gives us more confidence and actually fuels us to want to create more extra and gives us the ability to allow that extra to be present without us immediately spending it. And then we obey. Then we step out. Then we make a contribution with some of that extra. We invest it in a family that's in need. We invest it in a cause that is breaking our heart that we want to be about. And all of a sudden, we have this reinforcement of, oh, that's why I want to have this margin. That's why I want to make sure I don't live right up to the edge. These are opposite ends of the same spectrum. One feedback loop is telling you just spend more and eventually you'll find happiness. The other feedback loop says, draw the line. Tell yourself enough is enough and you'll actually find shalom. You'll find contentment and peace. And in that contentment and peace, you will find delight in continuing in obedience to what God is asking you to do with his resources. So what I want to encourage us with is to take time every year as we're stepping into the year, we're coming up here on the end of 2023. This is normally a time where we start thinking about 2024. And I don't want to wait until we get to you know the Christmas season and we're spending like crazy and we're kind of sucked into that lore of more because Christmas is a season where we can really fall prey to that. This is a great time to start thinking about what do we want the next year to look like? What has our life been costing? And what do we want to do in the coming 12 months? Where can we draw those lines now? Where can we start to get more intentional about picking up those non-negotiables that matter the most to us and putting down things that aren't as important? This is the time to start making those decisions before the next year starts in order for us to get practiced at this habit of tracking and understanding what our life costs. And if we don't have a plan now to draw those lines, we'll find ourselves in January after the Christmas season has come and gone, focusing on trying to make up for all the overspending that we just did. And so start now to draw those lines and decide ahead of time how you're going to use God's resources. Call your communities to do the same. This is a perfect opportunity for us to set ourselves up for a great 2024 that starts to move us further in our stewardship journey and give us access to the shalom we're always craving. Well, thank you so much for listening to the Faithful Steward podcast. Be sure to check out the show notes for links and other information that we mentioned in today's episode. Also, be sure to check out our website at goodsensemovement.org to get all the resources we offer churches to help equip them in teaching financial stewardship to their community. If you have any questions or any topics you want to make sure we cover on our show, you can email me at jameslenhoff at goodsensemovement.org. I'd love to hear from you. I hope you all have a great week. We'll talk to you next week.